good afternoon everyone welcome all to today's uh, indians program today we have psychiatric rehabilitation services indian scenario so the lecture is going to be taken by dr jagdisha tirthalli who is professor of psychiatry and also head of psychiatric rehabilitation services at nimhans he is a uh, well known researcher in schizophrenia ect and psychiatric rehabilitation in india and uh, worldwide so we welcome you for today's class sir uh, one more thing about today's class is that uh, this session is usually not found in textbooks uh, the indian scenario we will we'll read about rehabilitation elsewhere we'll read we can read it in textbooks but what happens in india uh, most of us would not know during our uh, md dnb days or even after uh, when we start uh, practicing when uh, i had given dnb theory exams this was also one of the questions which uh, we had to face at that point of time it was very difficult to uh, answer because we did not know much about this but now uh, we have uh, brought this up uh, topic so that everybody gets uh, helped by uh, this topic in, not only in writing answer in, uh, if a theory question comes but also to refer people to help people uh, it would be relevant to know what happens in our own country uh, with this uh, introductory remarks the i hand over the stage to dr jagdish atith so good afternoon to all of you in today's uh, lecture there are uh, uh, you can say that i will be dealing with uh, two um, important uh, divisions of this lecture one i will be talking uh, nearly about one third of my lecture would be about some concepts about rehabilitation in psychiatry um we all uh, when we talk about uh, rehab rehabilitation um we all have different perceptions about what is rehabilitation i had uh, checked with uh, one of my teenage uh, nephews about uh, do you have you heard of rehabilitation he immediately said yes i know it is something that is done to people who get addicted to mobile phones and computers and video games for them to come out of it that is called rehabilitation so that is his uh, version of rehabilitation uh, many people talk about rehabilitation as a de addiction uh, process rehab is uh, very much linked to uh, you know forcibly taking a person who is addicted to al al alcohol or any other kind of substances into a group of in a, in a place where they are restrained they are denied of these substances uh, and you know they are uh, treated in a different way kept for about a few months and then released as as if they have been rehabilitated this is a another very stereotyped perception about what is rehabilitation when it comes to core psychiatric rehabilitation many people uh, get this picture of uh, day care centers um, or uh, places where uh, people who are hopelessly symptomatic and for chronically symptomatic they nobody can take care of them for uh, in their homes and they are kept in some place indefinitely so uh, that is considered as rehab some day care centers where people make some candles covers or uh, so they stitch some things or do some crafts that is equated with uh, uh, rehabilitation or uh, keeping patients forever in a secluded place as rehabilitation and many of my former uh, students uh, ask me can i set up a rehabilitation center when i ask what it what it means they would say that it will be something like a half a home or a long term care etc i do think that these are all important parts of rehabilitation but i want to uh, focus a little bit on a nuanced perception of what is rehabilitation i'll be talking about this nuanced perception in a while from now the second half of my uh, two thirds of my uh, lecture would be mostly about uh, factual details about the indian scene as uh, chetan was saying if you get a short notes on uh, uh, rehabilitation indian scene the latter part may be of some help to you but the first part will hopefully make you uh, better clinicians and to look at a uh, person as a uh, holistic uh, entity and help the person to achieve what he or she 
wanted to achieve before they became sick. In this lecture, you will see many references in uh, brackets. Uh, you keep those things in mind. Uh, the reference list will be given at the end of the uh, entire presentation. I hope this uh, PowerPoint is being uh, shared with them. You can go through them. Uh, many of these uh, references are our own publication. Uh, not because I wanted to sell myself, but I just wanted to uh, highlight that we have some, we have dirtied our hands into this and learned over time. And you can find very good cross references from these references. Okay. Now, uh, there are two terms, psychiatric rehabilitation, psychosocial rehabilitation. What are these? Now, in my opinion, psychiatric rehabilitation is part of a psychosocial rehabilitation. Psychosocial rehabilitation is a much broader term, not necessarily constrained to psychiatric conditions. For example, in the current uh, COVID uh, situation, psychosocial rehabilitation of migrant workers, psychosocial rehabilitation of displaced population, psychosocial rehabilitation of persons who are undergoing trauma. So they are not necessarily linked to psychiatric conditions. So, but yet, like for example, there is a dam constructed, a lot of uh, tribals get uh, displaced from there. So they also can be given psychosocial rehabilitation. So we are not going to talk about that. We are going to talk about psychiatrically ill people, especially those who have severe mental illness, developmental disabilities, how we can help them, them to uh, improve their quality of life and how they can lead satisfactory life. That is what is called as psychiatric rehabilitation. Today's lecture is going to be about psychiatric rehabilitation. Uh, rehabilitation, the definition is restoration of something that is lost or damaged. In health, it is restoration of health and complete functionality. Is rehabilitation different from treatment? Now, if you ask me that question, I will ask a cross question. What is the goal of treatment? Is the goal of the treatment is to cure the disease irrespective of what happens to the person, then it's a different story. I think the goal of treatment is not only you treat the illness, but also you help the person who has the illness. For example, if I, if a person comes to me with uh, hallucinations and I give him close up, which controls hallucinations very well, but he sleeps for about 16 hours a day, would that be a successful treatment? It will be something similar to a person having a successful cardiac surgery and the person dies of septicemic shock. So the operation is success, but the patient is dead. So treatment in psychiatry should not end up like that. Treatment is not about symptoms. Treatment is about the person. So there is a large overlap between treatment and rehabilitation. The goal of treatment ultimately is rehabilitation. So roughly we can say that what we do with medicines, etc., can be considered as treatment, psychotherapy, etc., etc. But once the symptoms are under control to enhance the person's life situation, we can call it as rehabilitation. So when it comes to the goal of treatment in severe mental illnesses, importantly, we need to get the freedom of symptoms. Without that, we cannot talk about rehabilitation. Another important aspect is prevention of relapse and remaining the person should remain as much as possible in remission and optimal functioning in all spheres of life. Most clinicians do a good job of the first two because it largely depends on pharmacotherapy. The third one requires more and more resources and it is hard to find uh, such resources, so it may get ignored. I have one uh, suggestion for all clinicians. At every consultation, the psychiatrist should ask himself, can this person do any better than the current condition? Over time, we get used to seeing that, okay, person came with delusions and hallucinations or manic symptoms or depression. Now these symptoms are not there, he is doing well. Is that so? Can he do anything better? If you ask this question honestly, every time that you see a patient, you will find that rehabilitation is very, very important. Because pharmacotherapy alone cannot be a satisfactory answer. So here, 
on the one end of this road we have remission where the person's symptoms are better you if you ask the person what does he really want he, in addition to remission he wants recovery he wants to pursue his life goals that is what is recovery all about but from remission to recovery there are so many hurdles that you can see in this it could be negative symptoms post psychotic depression demoralization stigma discrimination expressed emotion side effects financial difficulties many many things that pharmacotherapy cannot help in this road which is topsy and turvy rehabilitation uh, finds a place now who needs rehabilitation nearly almost every person with severe mental illnesses and developmental disabilities will require rehabilitation the question is how much we may be able to provide and with what quality if you are asked a questions about uh, question about uh, evidence based rehabilitation procedures or interventions you have this here there is a long list of evidence based interventions which are useful for psychosocial uh, rehabilitation social skill training cognitive retraining family intervention cbt etc but there are a number of challenges in providing these high end uh, rehabilitation interventions to many people like for example how many people need it nearly almost everybody needs it do we have human resource we don't have human resource even to give them pharmacotherapy we have okay one person may require multiple interventions okay a patient who has recovered from let's say schizophrenia may have residual social anxiety as well as cognitive difficulties so who can give both of these intervention to him it can be a challenge you take the life course perspective rehab needs of a person who is student he is to finish his education lo he finishes education now the challenge of who will give him an occupation comes some of you get him an occupation now he looks at marriage marriage comes with its own baggage of challenges post marriage child birth child rearing parenting you know every stage of a person with severe mental illness you find some challenge which if a person a clinician should uh, take into account and help the person with biggest challenge in our country is accessibility where do we get rehabilitation inputs where is the time where is the place for that can they afford it you may have a wonderful uh, concept of let's say heart therapy or drama therapy can a village dwelling person accept it as a useful treatment acceptance is an issue longevity of the effect you may do a very good job and restore the person's cognition let's say suppose there is a relapse does the intervention that i mean the intervention that you did does its effect last post a relapse also we don't have answers for these things there are so many challenges in delivering these evidence based psychosocial interventions uh, as part of rehabilitation i'll tell a little on early intervention and continued management i think it is very well known that early interventions help in psychiatry in general there is a very good review you can see this in the reference number 2 but if you carefully look at it the focus is not is as much on early but it is also on continued engagement there is no point in treating early and not continuing sustaining it with a comprehensive uh, package of rehabilitation because if, if you just intervene and leave the person is very very likely to relapse and each relapse adds to disability it is very well known that a person who has a, a the relapse will experience some kind of uh, neurotoxicity i also talk about what is called a psychotoxicity with every relapse the person's confidence will come down the person's chances of getting more cognitive uh, 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 impairment more despondency more uh, demoralization increases of course there will be what i call call it as socio toxicity 
which every relapse the persons the he goes away from the society families get frustrated community gets frustrated or employers get frustrated the person effectively goes away from his main track with every relapse so prevention of relapse and prevent is equate you can equate with prevention of disability which is a very critical part of rehabilitation that is where we should focus on relapse prevention for a comprehensive rehabilitation so ensuring adherence is critical and mind you non adherence is a very complex issue it's not just about okay he is not he is a non adherent we will give him fluoxetine he is non adherent we will give him surreptitious medication it is not as straight forward as that there is a lot of things that is required continued availability of accessible uh, uh, continued availability of medicines at the accessible location there is cost issue there is adverse effect issue perceived improvements insight stigma there are so many things that determine adherence or non adherence so it is important that clinicians should be aware of it so how many of uh, the patient that we see will require advanced interventions that i listed a few slides ago i think my colleagues have talked about this pyramid and at the bottom you can see what people will require in large numbers that is self care and informal community care which are very very cost effective they require less amount of resources a lot of people need it but we can supply that with less uh inputs when you go to the top of the pyramid it is in the top of the pyramid you will see high end rehabilitation inputs which will be required by a small number of people but the costs are very very high this is what we give in places like nim hands which will be useful for only a small proportion of people whereas a large proportion of people just require small, little bit of help and it can be given very easily like patients and families may be self reliant in majority of the cases so for them continued pharmacotherapy alone is the rehabilitation input but it is very crucial for their rehabilitation ensuring continuous medications so that they don't relapse is very important for the middle level for a, you know dmhp social workers can do a lot of these things trained lay counselors may be required to provide a smaller proportion of people and only a few will require highly specialized uh, inputs so a large proportion of patients just need minimal professional int intervention that is because in india families do what in western countries may be called as case workers work they ensure adherence to medication they engage with treating teams they help about comprehensive rehabilitation they provide a warm atmosphere in most cases not in all and patients can take help from community and governmental and non governmental agencies and rehabilitate themselves okay but it is very crucial that all this uh, family and community involvement is there the professionals are not required in here does it work yes there is a plenty of evidence that just continuing medications and just doing very brief psychosocial intervention mostly to ensure adherence and see to that the person is engaged in some work or not will help it improves the course and outcome of the illness it improves work related outcome it reduces disability and social participation it reduces family burden and it reduces the cost of treatment all of these are indian research which has shown that for rehabilitating people in community all that you need to do is to ensure continuity of care and do very low intensity psychosocial intervention helping the people to get back to their routine it is possible hence an important part of indian uh, contribution of uh, i mean important part of uh, psychiatric rehabilitation in india uh, is uh, to do with nmhp and dmhp right now the emphasis in nmhp and dmhp is on identification and initiation of treatment but we should move from there to ensuring continuity 
of care and rehabilitation it this becomes very important i anticipate that the dmhp should slowly move into cbr programs community based rehabilitation programs there is an enough evidence that cbr works but it is in cbr projects my colleague dr sevakumar would have spoken to you about cbr project versus cbr program cbr projects are small time limited focused uh, interventions whereas cbr programs are sustainable and they are for a larger population cbr projects have been done there is enough evidence that cbr works what we need is cbr programs which should take the rehabilitation to the communities interestingly under the national mental health program in india there is provision for taluk level social workers for mental health and many of the references that i gave in the previous slide we have used one taluk level social worker to deliver a lot of rehabilitative inputs and with that amount of input we were possible it was possible for providing comprehensive and sustainable cbr we have just started a very uh, ambitious program of karnataka state holistic empowerment program for mental ailments called kshema which is precisely trying to get these taluk level social workers to deliver comprehensive cbr having said that i will come to the stereotyped uh, perception about rehabilitation the age old perception about rehabilitation that means this day care long term etc etc so i don't want to be little them they are very very important I, i i completely agree that it is very important and the following are very important as part of it which are long stay homes short stay homes like quarter way half way and three quarters homes quarter way homes are from mental hospital to half way home so they are intermediary between mental hospital and half way home three quarters homes are from half way home to communities and then community living there are other options of community living and then day cares and independent living options these are all traditionally associated with the or the stereotyped uh, uh, perception about rehabilitation who are providing these rehabilitation inputs in india or the institution based rehabilitation who is providing the government is not very uh, big in its role in uh, institution based rehabilitation there are a few tertiary care institutes like nimhans where a comprehensive uh, rehabilitation input is available in karnataka there is a program called manasudhara where uh, the government with the help of ngos runs day care in all district headquarters in a private public partnership model there are a couple of long stay facilities or you can call it as half a home like facilities called manasa kendra in karnataka I'm not very sure there may be such programs in other states as well but there are uh, to the best of my knowledge there are no government run or government supported long term facilities where people who cannot be cared for anywhere else will have to be uh, cared for but many patients are stuck in mental health institutes now many state governments have long term care facilities for children and adults with intellectual disabilities i think in almost all districts there are uh, places where uh, adults and children with intellectual disabilities are housed and looked after by the state under the national trust act the ngos can apply for these following that is vikas that is day care samarth that is respite care gharonda that is group home for adults these are not for mental illness these are for developmental disabilities including intellectual disability autism and uh, cerebral palsy and multiple disabilities recently in 2018 uh, a revised version of deen dayal disabled rehabilitation scheme has been launched under this scheme the for mental health one may one ngos can apply for halfway homes the government will fund halfway homes but the government will not run these halfway homes they will 
fund the NGOs to run halfway homes. And there are also funds for starting special schools for children with intellectual disabilities. These are some of the government supported or government run rehabilitation uh, facilities that one can look at. But a major part uh, of this institution based rehabilitation is done by uh, private sector. So there are uh, not for profit organizations or NGOs. They play a very good, very big role in rehabilitation. There are some profit facilities, for profit facilities, like private uh, halfway homes or private uh, uh, places where they take a lot of uh, lump sum of amount and take care of the person with disability for many years. There are a few medical colleges which are also private medical colleges which are running uh, daycare. There are some medical colleges which run long term uh, care facilities as well. Some of the examples. Uh, of uh, these NGOs that you can note, uh, Richmond Fellowship Society that is has branches in Bangalore, Lucknow, Delhi, etc. Then there is Skidafnia Research Foundation, SCARF, which runs daycare and long-term uh, care facilities and community facilities also. Then there is Skidafnia Awareness Association in Pune, Medico Pastoral Association in uh, Bangalore. There are many of them. Now, where can you find all, all these things? There are two resources you can note down, which are from NIMHANS. On the left side, you find a directory of mental health care centers. Many of these are rehab centers, which are available in South India. The reference number 16, you can download this PDF. We have recently launched a website called RAH. It is under construction, but you can explore this as of now. It is not complete. So you can get some information, but not complete. So this is uh, another source that you can uh, look for. Now, talking about rehabilitation homes for persons with mental illness, large proportion of mental homeless persons with uh, mental illness, they are called as HPMI. Now, large population of these are mental illness. If you look at Homeless people, many of them will have mental illness. How many of them are there? I don't think we have good numbers. I mean, the numbers are elusive. It is easily, it runs into a few lakhs, I guess. Why do they, why do we have homeless persons with mental illness? It's a very complex uh, situation. Many patients with mental illness may wander off and they don't know how to go back to their uh, original places. But a substantial number of them have family issues. Either the families have deliberately rejected them or deliberately left them in some forest or some railway station and gone back or they would have burnt out over time taking care of this person repeatedly relapsing person okay baba bus i think it is over now you have to i need to get rid of you that kind of burnout can be there then very commonly you will find many of these homeless people having comorbidity with intellectual disability, substance use, epilepsy, etc. Of course, there is poor community care. I mean, the care of these people have been done only by families. There is no support from the society, no support from government. And it leads to some kind of burnout and abandonment. Right now, where are these uh, people living? These people are in mental health institutes, either government run or private NGOs. Many of them are living in so-called beggars colonies or destitute homes. Each state government runs facilities for people who are otherwise homeless. Many of these facilities seem to house people with mental illness. There are many religious institutions like temples, dargahs, churches, and you know their subsidiaries which take care of people with uh, people who are homeless with mental illness. Each state government runs uh, homes for women who don't have other places to go or vulnerable women. Many of these houses are full of persons with mental illness also, in addition to not mentally ill people. There are many old age homes run by private or NGO people. A large number of them will have persons with mental illness also in them. 
of course prisons and streets are the other places where you will find homeless persons with mental illness what is the problem with uh, the institutes there is poor standard of uh, care and quality of life overall there is loss of autonomy and freedom all kind of freedom that we enjoy people who are in institutes institutes are deprived of there is no personal freedom i cannot go out i cannot choose my friends i cannot uh, have recreation of my uh, liking i cannot have relations i cannot i don't have cousins uncles aunts with whom all of us you know uh, enjoy i have don't have as much religious freedom as i would have at outside the uh, institute i have to depend completely on others for financial uh, freedom of course i cannot vote in many cases i cannot you know um, have a ration card i cannot have a um, aadhar card i don't have the identity of myself this is what happens to people who are stuck in mental health institutes of course there is over time they lose their own identity they become part of the institute the despondency comes in demoralization comes in poor quality of food and living arrangements people are in uniforms which again takes away the sense of identity they get stereotyped they lose over time loss of they lose social occupation and other kind of social skills and it becomes increasingly difficult to discharge them but the good thing is that there are a lot of efforts being made to take care of this homeless person with mental illness in india ngos are taking an active role to provide better life for them i have listed a few there are many of them shraddha foundation of mumbai or somewhere near mumbai which has reunited about 8000 plus uh, people of uh, homeless persons with mental illness to their families the banyan in chennai which has now branched out into trichy kerala maharashtra also they also take acute and long term care of homeless persons with mental illness they have a unique program called home again where group houses are uh, provided for women who are recovering from mental illness with lot of freedom they they get all these freedoms that i listed uh, in my previous slide chitadama in karnataka ashadeep in assam these are some of the examples of how ngos are taking care of homeless persons with mental illness what about those who are stuck in government institutes there are about 43 government run mental institutes in india in the recent survey that we did 6000 people patients are there in these 43 uh, government run institutes who are staying for more than one year and majority of them are in a dischargeable condition they can go back to the community but they are stuck there because of various reasons that i uh, enlisted as causes of homelessness the numbers were higher earlier and the conditions were extremely pathetic about two decades back i would say but now these places are relatively better because the nhrc national human rights commission has sent its team repeatedly to these places recommended made sure funds come and the quality has slightly better i mean substantially better but still much lower than what one would expect there has been greater budget allocation to these institutes there have been very very good proactive mental health medical superintendents of these institutes who have improved their uh, uh, institutes very well of course there are some of these mental health institutes have run started running pg courses and when they run pg courses they get a little more manpower they become more open and they uh, seem to improve their quality overall judiciary has a long very very uh, powerful uh, presence in, in the long term care of uh, persons who are stuck in government institutes there has been couple of uh, public interest litigations about patients who can be discharged they who continue to languish in uh, mental health institutes now the central and state governments have recently come up with a road map for discharging these people and providing them after care so that they will not go back to uh, the same institutes then there are active efforts to trace their families and transfer them to the many less restrictive facilities 
but we should be mindful that there is a risk of what is called as trans institutionalization they are now institutionalized in government settings if families don't come forward but there is pressure for us to discharge them from government institutes we may end up discharging them to other institutes which may not be very dissimilar to uh, the government health institutions or even worse so that we should be uh, watchful and guard against such a eventuality so patient should not be shifted just because we need to empty the government health institutions i'm not going to talk too much about legislations about rehabilitation in india these have been covered but i want to just highlight that in these legislations rehabilitation has been given a very strong impetus particularly in the first one rights of persons with disabilities act access to comprehensive rehabilitation is now the right of the person with disabilities if a person is denied of rehabilitation input the responsible government will have to be can be pulled up by judiciary by the law it provides for many entitlements like pension like reservations like reservation in education job uh, and then uh, uh, health insurance etc which helps a lot in recovery process reservation in jobs and educational institutions we have uh, the central government and many state governments have already identified which jobs can be reserved for persons with mental illness who apply for these posts under the disability quota mental health care act also again says treatment is the right of the person and treatment includes accessible and affordable home based and community based rehabilitation so again mental health care act says that rehabilitation has become the right of the person with mental health related disabilities national trust act is there which is focusing on developmental disabilities you should be aware of this rehabilitation council of india act because it sets the standards for rehabilitation on professionals people who work with disabled persons and for rehabilitation must be registered either with the rehabilitation council of india or with the medical council of india under the mental health care act so without these registrations rehabilitation professionals can be considered as doing some kind of a quackery so that should be avoided this uh, rule uh, this uh, act is very important in from that perspective you may be aware or may not be aware that there is a national institute of mental health rehabilitation very fresh it was initiated just last year in sihor district of madhya pradesh it is under the ministry of social justice and empowerment it focuses on clinical care human resource development and research in mental health rehabilitation and it is already running a course for caregivers of persons with mental health related disability there are other national institutes which are related to uh, mental health care uh, disability uh, rehabilitation that is national institute of for the empowerment of persons with intellectual disabilities it is in secunderabad it was formerly known as nimh and there is national institute of for the empowerment of persons with multiple disabilities in chennai we have professional bodies in india which work for mental health rehabilitation world association of psychosocial rehabilitation has an indian chapter it is a member of wapr global indian association for social psychiatry also focuses a lot on rehabilitation again it is a member association of world association of social psychiatry indian psychiatric society ips itself has a specialty section on rehabilitation all these professional bodies hold conferences related to directly or indirectly to mental health rehabilitation indians are very big in rehabilitation in the world field the current president of wapr is a former professor of nimhans who is working now in ms ramaya medical college dr murli vice president is from india and dr matthew orgis who is the treasurer he is from nimhans coming to the last bit indian research on rehabilitation psychiatry indian researchers have been very active in research in psychiatric rehabilitation it is difficult to quantify the contribution but 
because they, they, they are published in different keywords like rehabilitation, disability limitation, recovery, retraining, etc. These may be the recover. These are some of the words that they would have used. So if you want to search how many papers are there on rehabilitation about mental illness in India, it is difficult to get. But if you put in a keyword of rehabilitation in IJP alone, you get about 350 plus papers. So Indian research in psychiatric rehabilitation has appeared in several reputed journals also, not just Indian Journal of Psychiatry. Uh, very top end journals also have published very, uh, like Lancet, has published many uh, papers related to rehabilitation of mentally ill people in India. Of course, we have our own uh, journal of psychosocial rehabilitation and mental health. So a couple of us in demands are the editors in chief. So this is to, I mean, this is not an Indian journal. It is an international journal, but its editors are Indians and we publish a lot of research from India in this. So these are the references for what I quoted in my uh, talk. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you for your uh, lucid presentation as usual. So there is one question though uh, from Manjunath Masali. How to get guardianship for mentally uh, guardianship for mentally ill patients? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the rules uh, have not yet come from the for the guardianship. Um, it is uh, to be uh, uh, in Karnataka state rules. Uh, the, I think it might have come very very recently during this pandemic. There was some uh, uh, news on that. I am not very sure. Um, uh, just a few, uh, I mean, before this act came, it was always through the court. Now, I think uh, similar to National Trust Act, there are local level committees which may be enabled to issue guardianship. Otherwise, it is, I mean, the, the, the route through the court is very clear. You can always appeal to the court to get a guardianship. But there are other uh, avenues also, I think, uh, under the RPWD Act, it is being made a little more easy so that uh, guardianship can be given from what are called as local level committees, which are easy to convene and easy to get the guardianship. But mind you, the guardianship is going to be only limited guardianship. In the earlier act, there was something called as plenary guardianship. Once you get the guardianship, forever the person was a guardian. Now it is it will be for a limited period and for a limited purpose only, unless the person is let's say very profoundly uh, retarded or you know has profound IDD. Uh, in such cases, uh, uh, you can go through the National Trust Act that is still in vogue. You can get easily from the local level committees. I hope it answers the question. Questions: How can PSW uh, help apart from uh, counselling? Uh, what is their role? Oh, PSW has a very very large role in uh, rehabilitation. I, I would say counselling will be the least important. Um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, persons with uh, uh, one one thing that PSW can definitely do is to explore the challenges for continuity of care. Okay, there are very very uh, what what I can call as modifiable uh, factors for non-adherence. It could be distance, accessibility of medicines, uh, availability of. Uh, uh, consultants to for follow up, etc. PSW can easily coordinate this and see to that the person does not stop medication and relapse frequently. So that's a very, very uh, big contribution a PSW can do. But the PSW can also do a lot more things. He can be an advocate for the person's rights. He can help him to get disability certificate and enjoy all the entitlements and uh, other facilities that the government can give to the person. These, are, they, these may look very small, but they go, in, they go a long way in helping the person. I'll give a small example. Disability pension. How does it help in rehabilitation? If not for anything, the, person, the money can be used to get medications which may not be available with the government or that, let's say somebody has a lot of sedation with clozapine or uh, let's say risperdone or olanzapine which is available free from the government. But the person may do very well with aripiprazole. Aripiprazole will not be available. 
in a government setting. The pension money can be used for that. So the PSW can coordinate this. The PSW can coordinate work with what are called as village level uh, rehabilitation workers, multi-purpose rehabilitation workers, district disabled welfare officer, and help the persons to get a lot of uh, benefits of uh, disability certificate and its uh, 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 you know follow up of the certificate and. Of course, they can help them in uh, educational rehabilitation, vocational rehabilitation, uh, network with NGOs which can uh, accommodate uh, rehabilitative uh, inputs for these patients. So PSWs have a very, very big role. In fact, psychiatrists have very less role. Is there any pi public-private partnership or any financial help offered by government for private mental health professionals willing to establish mental health rehab facility? If you have an NGO, yes. Uh, there is a very clear, uh, there are two schemes uh, I can straight away say. There may be more. I'm not a, an expert in this. One is Deen Dayal Upadhyaya, uh, Deen Dayal uh, Rehabilitation Scheme. It is a central government scheme which has come just last year, 2018-19 it came. Um, an NGO uh, uh, can apply for running a halfway home through this. The government will uh, fund uh, for, a, I mean, it, it gives a substantial fund. I think you may have to get some other funds from some other source and run it. Manasudhara is another uh, uh, PPP model which is running in Karnataka. You can apply uh, for uh, uh, running a Manasudhara in any of the districts of uh, uh, Karnataka. Uh, sir, apart from uh, referrals, uh, what can an individual private uh, practitioner uh, do to rehabilitate patients? Um, I just showed in one of my slides please ask yourself whether this person can do better. Um, many of us get satisfied with the uh, symptom relief. That should not be done. We should always look at whether this person's life can be improved. There are a lot of things that a, a psychiatrist can do, provided he should give time. Time is crucial. So you cannot um, rehabilitation, you cannot do rehabilitation only by medicines. Medicines are important. You see if the person, if person is disabled, can you do any um, uh, changes with medications so that his ability to work will improve? Like if he is drowsy, review the uh, medications and give him less uh, sedation causing drugs. See if there is significant social anxiety can be there in many people, which may show as negative symptoms. The person may not be meeting with people, but there may be social anxiety. Many a times they may have some uh, uh, obsessions, uh, uh, which may prevent them from, uh, you know, uh, going for work, etc. So that kind of uh, clinical uh, uh, inquiry into what can be uh, modified in this person that that I think goes without saying. Now beyond that, the person can do brief family interventions, lies with NGOs for any employment or education opportunities, or work with any. Um, religious uh, 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 based uh, people who can also help the, the person getting some, uh, 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 you know, not just religious, any other kind of people who do, do a lot of activities which are social in nature. So encourage the person to go into this. Sometimes this social uh, skills, etc., will improve by doing some, some of these things. So uh, of course, there are, each individual will have a different challenge and each individual uh, psychiatrist has to deal with them. But if you spend more time, that's you, you can find many methods of rehabilitation. Uh, sir, has the RPWD Act uh, suggested development of newer setups like halfway homes or sheltered workshops in India? Yes. Yes, it has. Sir, uh, what are the family interventions in psychiatric setting in rehabilitation? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, it, it completely is a question about family uh, intervention, not so much about rehabilitation per se. There are many methods of family intervention. The psychodynamic therapies, psycho uh, analytic uh, family therapies. There are uh, uh, behavioral family therapies. There are uh, supportive family therapies. These are varieties of family therapy. Now, coming to uh, rehabilitation. Uh, we, you can use any of these. Apparently, psychodynamic and psychoanalytical family therapies are contraindicated in uh, schizophrenia, but I have seen people doing that as well. 
but behavioral methods of family therapy uh, any family therapy uh, geared to uh, reduce uh, expressed emotions go uh, helps in rehabilitation sir uh, how to start a rehab center and what are all the permissions required mm. chetan i think you should answer this <laughs> uh, so again not to advertise we have uh, bought up a book called nuts and bolts of starting and running psychiatric rehabilitation services uh, from nimans publication it is available uh, through nimans publication also or you can place your orders uh, uh, to our mail also we uh, send that uh, book it cost 200 rupees uh, as of now so in that book we have also spoken not only about uh, the nitty gritties of uh, how to run and start and run we have services about various permissions required various uh, acts to which it should be compliant uh, it, this was bought before mental health care act and rpwd act so uh, only that legal chapter is uh, a bit old uh, chapter but otherwise it also has uh, chapters on what should a psw do what should a Uh, clinical psychologists do what is the role of psychiatrists nurses so uh, it has uh, various chapters on all these aspects uh, so uh, one can go through that book uh, to know more about how to start and run rehab services uh, thank you sir uh, sir uh, how to uh, build sense of build a sense of community build a sense of community among people with mental illness it happens um, or else automatically if uh, you, uh, any person who has been running a day care center will or any other long term psychiatric rehabilitation centers will vouch for this that uh, many uh, it, it is very commonly observed that many of them uh, gel together and develop a sense of community by themselves or is, i don't know whether that is the right i mean that is what is expected of this question of different skills you mentioned which one do you think is the most important adl training social skills training uh, which of them is uh, most important i'll ask the patient which is most important for you that is most important for me <laughs> sir what about the multi uh, welcome to areas? welcome to person centered uh, <laughs> approach so we don't decide anything okay patient and the family as a unit they will decide what is important for them and uh, it works wonders if you uh, adopt this and not impose what you think is important yeah. uh, sir at this juncture i also want want to uh, bring in one of the statements usually given by dr sukumar Uh, who is uh, additional professor of psychiatry in uh, psychiatric rehab services the moment you realize that you are you are not like a doctor you are not paternalistic you are like a server in a hotel then uh, your learning for psychiatric rehabilitation begins so uh, like the way a server in a hotel will not impose what is good in their restaurant uh, to the people who come there uh, they they simply ask what do you want and uh, the people usually ask what they want and you provide that service if you think that that is not good you only suggest you don't uh, go back to the uh, even though the person has ordered something you don't go back to the kitchen and uh, we uh, i mean we work up the order you give something else to the uh, person that doesn't work so only when you uh, satisfy the needs of the person who has come uh, actual rehabilitation starts yeah so it's true of not just rehabilitation chetan it is the duty of every doctor let alone psychiatrist to do that yes uh, sir uh, what about multidisciplinary approach to intensive care in these rehabilitation in india and uh, how much are we integrating them back to community uh, i think it uh, depends um, um, i think in nimhans our experience has been fairly good i mean i think uh, uh, um, we used to be very overcrowded earlier now uh, i think many of our patients have been reintegrated into families there are uh, many places where uh, it has happened uh, dr ravi shankar was with us uh, he they have integrated dozens of patients uh, from chitadama who were homeless to their families shraddha foundation has done it in thousands uh, they have reintegrated with their families so um, 
okay reintegration is not a uh, single step it's a process okay so in, it doesn't happen as an event it you may have reintegrated the person back to family but how sustained is that reintegration is important so it is not just about discharging the person it is about maintaining him or her in the community in a good health becomes an important aspect so in that sense backup support is very important that is where um, local resources of uh, psychiatrists dmhp dmhp social worker psychologist etc come into play and that is uh, the, if if that backup is there reintegration can be done uh, more successfully it is multidisciplinary of course sir uh, continuing uh, this like if the family is not willing to take care of the person despite being manageable is there any legal uh, way recourse for this uh, to the best of my knowledge we cannot force the family to look after a person unless he is elderly i think for elderly i mean if 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 the uh, patient is elderly and uh, the caregiver is the son or a daughter also i don't know but there is a law in india chetan you may know Uh, which will mandate that the sons should take care of their parents but i don't think there is any other law i mean of course if the child I mean, the patient is minor also it is the obligation of the parents for uh, normal adults uh, who don't fall into these extremes uh, there is no law which can force a sibling or a wife or a husband that you must look after this person now if the family is not taking care of the person the persons uh responsibility lies with the state the state uh, is obliged to give uh, care for these people uh, but fortunately i don't think the numbers are in uh, enormous amount there are a few thousands or maybe tens of thousands of people who are left without any support where state either has been taking care or ngos are taking care but we need to move a lot uh, in this direction and the state should start giving quality and um, quality care including autonomy and a true sense of rehabilitation and recovery for these people and not just close them down into one mental health institute uh, sir in addition to that uh, what also has been uh, told in uh, rpwd and uh, mental health care act is also that something called as least restrictive environment so this least restrictive environment can be in the community can be in a half a home can be in the hospital also so it doesn't uh, uh, tell that okay least restrictive environment is only in the family and uh, uh, only there the person has to be uh, rehabilitated or rehabilitated to it is not so if uh, uh, as sir was mentioning there is no law to mandate people to uh, go back to their uh, families but uh, the state means to say either uh right now the district disabled welfare office or the district commissioner uh, will be or uh, the person who is heading the uh, the department of uh, social welfare and justice so these are the people who uh, will usually uh, come into picture to uh, take care of uh, persons with mental illness because they will be the uh, guardians as nominated by the government if they don't have any other uh, guardians sir how to give us give specific uh, psychiatric rehab effectively in sustainable basis uh, especially during disaster situations yeah if you know the answer please tell us <laughs> we are um, I, I, um, to tell the least rehabilitation itself was in disaster before the disaster came to us okay so we we never had a very satisfactory Uh, picture of rehabilitation in india for majority of the patients a small number of patients were able to get very good quality rehabilitation uh, in some institutes ngos etc etc now that uh, i mean if you are talking about a disaster like uh, corona pandemic uh, then uh, um, we are trying to do uh, our best through uh, tele uh, counseling uh, we are having uh, Uh, telephonic and uh, video based uh, interventions with individuals and their families and 
based on the individuals uh, background etc we are able to uh, get them to engage in some activity or the other um, i would say it's too early days for us over time i think i am very hopeful that we will learn from this and uh, emerge uh, with uh, innovative ideas as to how to engage these people uh, i think uh, um, uh, one resource i will uh, tell you the nimans recently uh, released a book on uh, mental health uh, care in the time of uh, corona pandemic in that there are a couple of chapters on rehabilitation you please uh, go through that you may get a few ideas from there uh, the book is available in nimans website uh, free of cost for uh, to everybody uh, sir please comment about the future of mental health services in indian scenario fingers crossed yeah i am I'm, um, i'm very hopeful uh, that uh, the um, what shall i say aspirational uh, legislations like mental health care act and uh, uh, rehabilitation i mean uh, rights of persons with disability act uh, will uh, um, uh, kind of if not revolutionize improve the situation of uh, mental illness and uh, rehabilitation process in uh, india um i hope a few of you will take the activistic role and uh, advocate for your patients rights um, if all of us become activistic and put these laws into practice it will improve if uh, we as professionals do not uh, spend uh, time and advocate for our uh, uh patients and clients uh it the it may not happen of course we can always uh, uh, advocate for families to come together and demand for their rights if uh, if there is demand i think the laws will mandate the government to give good service um incidentally the, i i i just observed that uh there was a lot of demand for alcohol and government started giving alcohol during the pandemic we didn't see any such demand made by persons with mental illness i need treatment now also please give me that so this kind of activism if it is there it will be good sir uh, thank you for the, your valuable time uh, coming here and presenting taking this class it was a wonderful class uh, kindly subscribe to our uh, youtube channel uh, nimans indians you will find all our uh, videos there this is the 33rd class we are uh, having in uh, indians so you will find all the other uh, uh, videos there and uh, any new upcoming videos also would be uh, posted uh, there so kindly uh, watch our youtube channel subscribe uh, to our youtube channel uh, sir uh, we thank dr jagdish sir for uh, taking this uh, class uh, we also thank clinics laboratories chennai for uh, giving us academic grants to run this uh, program uh, thank you everyone